SCC. Hey guys, I, I want you, yeah, that's the energy, that's the vibe. Hey, I got, want you guys to just push somebody very gently, just gently push somebody nearby and tell them good morning. There you go, gently, relax, you're in church, come on. And now your second favorite choice, I want you to look at somebody else and give them a fist bump and say, hey now. Yeah, like, hey now. Awesome guys, so my name is April. If you're wondering who the heck is up there with the mic, it's me, April. I'm the RCC uh, church hype girl, uh, self-appointed as a matter of fact, and I just gave my job, myself this job to get you excited about church. That's something I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, I feel like church is something we can be excited about. It's something we can actually enjoy, believe it or not. Did you guys know that? Um, it's something we can look forward to. And at RCC here, we say often that we're just a bunch of imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. And we don't say it all the time because it sounds good. We say it because it's true. So if you are in here and you are feeling imperfect, welcome to the party. Um, no matter how you're feeling today, though, whether you're just feeling a little bit off, a little bit down, um, God can meet you wherever you're at, and he can turn that around. And I'm believing that that's what's going to happen this morning. So however you're feeling... Um, even if you're feeling good, God can make you feel even better, right? So lean into the worship, lean in to the message, let God do something big. Um, and are you excited about it, guys? I mean, yeah. Are we excited about church, RCC? That's, that's a little bit weak. All right, I'm going to just let that one go. We're going to try it again maybe later. Um, by the way, how amazing was worship last week? Were you here last week with the new instruments, right? I almost felt like I was at a Led Zeppelin concert. Almost. Yeah. Okay, that got weird. All right, guys, let's pray together real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the moments that we share. Thank you for the time that we get to spend together with other believers. Father, thank you that we get to just be in your presence. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to just be here with us. I pray that it's not just songs that we're singing, Father, but that we're sending the very breath you gave us back to you. Lord, help us to remember that as we worship, something major can happen in our lives, in these moments, in our souls. Help us to feel that. I pray for Pastor Chris as he's about to deliver a message. Lord, I just pray that you'll be with him, speak through him, speak to us through him. And Lord, I pray that no matter how we're feeling, if anybody under the sound of my voice right now is just feeling down, is feeling off, Lord, I just pray that you will turn that around for them. And I pray that anybody that's feeling good, Father, help them to make them to feel even better. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, high five someone else as you stand up, and let's get ready to worship. If anybody wants to dance, I invite you to come join the dance pit up in the front, no matter what your age is, okay? Okay.
display and there's nothing wrong with that amen all right let's give God some praise and you can have a seat for just a moment I don't know whose water this is but it's mine now <laughs> Maybe it was. good morning RCC how's everybody doing today good everybody's good you have all day to get better right come on this is a this is an awesome day uh, where we are privileged once again to gather together with this awesome group. You guys are awesome. And we just get to worship a perfect God as imperfect people. And I'm just excited to be here with you today. I have just a couple quick announcements. Uh, this Wednesday is our Revive service, which starts at 6 o'clock right here in the park. We are doing breakfast foods this week, which is awesome. Uh, so make sure you come and be a part of that. You don't have to, there's no obligation. If you don't want to bring anything, don't. We just want you here to have fun, to have fellowship with us. Uh, after that, we have all the kids stuff going on in the gym, and the adults stick around for a uh, interactive Bible study. So please be a part of that. That's this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Breakfast foods are going to be on the table, and that is awesome. Uh, so the ladies have been having a good time at their Saturday morning Bible study, so I thought, well, we can't let them get away with that. So uh, us men, we're going to start getting together uh, for men's breakfast, and we are starting this Saturday at 8 o'clock at Spring House, okay? So we will have a Facebook invitation or event put up here. I'll either do it today or tomorrow uh, just to see how many people are coming just so we can get some space and things like that. It's just going to be a time of us guys getting together, eating some good food, having some good conversation, getting to know each other better, and just all talk about all the awesome things God is doing in our lives. That is open to any man. You don't have to come to RCC. It doesn't matter. You're welcome to, to join us and, and have some fun because the ladies can't have all the fun, guys. They just can't. Um, and our, our idea is to continue that every other Saturday at a different location. So we'll talk about the location for the next time, every time we meet. Um, also, this is going to turn into, uh, we're, we're going to do some things as a group as men too. We're going we're gonna to get into some Bible study eventually and get into some, some time getting together at each other's houses and just really building that relationship and affecting the community. So uh, I think it's awesome the things God is doing here at RCC. I don't know about you. I mean, I, pr I feel privileged to be here. I feel privileged to be able to call myself your pastor. It is an honor for me to be here with you. All right. Hey, oh, uh, one more announcement. Next Sunday is uh, Haas's day for Camp Blue Diamond. Um, we have the coupon slips back. Or they're not coupon slips, but they're slips with the identification number on it. You don't have to, it doesn't cost you a thing except for you're paying for your meal. 
So let's all go to Haas's next week, right? And just rock it out. They get camp gets a percentage of your total bill. Uh, so you're not paying any extra for it and the camp benefits from it, right? Isn't that cool? And then mark this on your calendars, March 5th. Uh, Brian Burt, who is the executive director of Camp Blue Diamond, will be here to talk to us very briefly. Don't think about this as a typical church mission Sunday, so please come, okay? Because we've all been through those where it's like slide after slide after slide after slide after slide. It's like, we get it, we want to help, but it's taking forever, right? Am I, am I the only one being honest about that? No. Okay, so it's not going to be like that. Brian just wants to share with you some of the exciting things going on at camp. He's going to just talk for a couple minutes, but be a part of what God is doing. We've made an awesome connection there. We're really excited for our kids. Uh, that some of the teenagers may, be, may get to be counselors out there and things like that. It is an awesome connection we've made, so uh, make sure you're here for that. Uh, any other announcements I forgot? Always a dangerous question to ask. Going once, going twice. Stand up and worship with us.
and every Our stories are not finished yet. 
God, I thank you that as long as there is breath in our lungs, we have purpose in you. And that, God, you give us that purpose each and every day. Your joy, your mercy, your blessings are new every day. God, we thank you so much for that. I pray right now, knowing that we are in your presence, God, I pray that your spirit would light up our hearts like a fire that cannot be contained. And God, that we would just open our hearts and our minds to you, to what you have to teach us today about what it's like to be in the presence of a holy God. God, we can't praise you and thank you enough. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, give someone a hug, a high five, or a handshake as our kids take off to Club Reignite. Next week, we may add another H action word, like hip check. I don't know. That might get dangerous. Okay, so I'm going to say something you may not hear in church often, but isn't it cool to be in a noisy church? <laughs> hear all those kids making all that noise because they're excited to go back to Club Reignite, where they are learning about Jesus on their level. Isn't that awesome that we are in a noisy church? Come on. You can be noisy, too. There you go. All right. So a couple things before I get started. If there are any first-time guests here, I want to say welcome to RCC. Uh, there's got lots of Sunday morning options. We talk about that a lot. Uh, we are honored that you chose to worship with us here today. If you've never had a chance to fill out a connection card, they're on every table. They're in those little stands. A uh, place for you to put your information, drop those in the offering bucket there. Uh, so we can stay connected with you and let you know about all the awesome things going on here at Redefined Community Church. Uh, that is also, as I mentioned, our offering bucket. So if you feel so led to support this ministry and your giving, uh, we encourage you. You can put your put your tithe and your offering in that bucket, and we will pray that God will bless you as a result. So uh, you ready to get started here today? Yeah. Come on, it's an exciting day. You can, you know, there are times, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but God's presence is everywhere, right? There's a big churchy word called omnipresence, and it just means God is everywhere, okay? It means he's literally everywhere. He is God. And, you know, we come here today, and, you know, everywhere we go is God's presence. We come in here every Sunday, and God's presence is here. But sometimes it's like God's presence is so here that it almost feels like you're in a different kind of atmosphere, right? You ever walk, you ever walk through, like, a very... Uh, like a, den a fog that's so dense that you can feel the moisture in the air. That's kind of how it feels to me sometimes. That's how it feels to here today. I got to be honest with you. It feels like God's presence is here with us today so strong. And he has something so awesome to share with us. Um, and, and honestly, this is something that I've been praying about, about what, what message to bring today. And we are going to be talking about the presence of God today. We've been talking for the past couple weeks about... Uh, some of the tentpole things that we believe, you know, some of the major things that we believe. We talked about um, who is God. We talked about, uh, we touched on prayer. We touched on, um, my mind's escaping me right now because I'm so excited about this. Uh, but we talked about a lot of things that are just like the tentpole things in our beliefs. So today we're going to be talking about, we talked about who, who is God. Last week we talked about the importance of speaking forth God's word, right? Don't be afraid to prophesy to those bones, right? This is something God wants us to do. Um, and today we're going to talk about what it's like to be in that presence. Because I'm sure you've heard in a church sometime, any given time, you've heard that phrase, the presence of God. Uh, or in the Bible, when you read about certain characters like Gideon or, or Mary or Moses, Abraham, this phrase has been used to describe their stories. And I hope someday it's used to describe my story. How about you? That the presence of God. Had, a, had everything to do with it. We use this phrase over and over and over again. You've heard it so many times. I can't help but wonder if we really truly understand what this phrase even means. We use it all the time in church, but what does it look like? What does it feel like? Where can we find God's presence? I mean, do we even have to look for it? Isn't God's presence everywhere? And even more so, is it even important for us to seek out God's presence if his presence is everywhere? I've been doing a lot of praying and thinking about God's presence. The goal here today is hopefully to answer some of these questions or at least get the conversation going. Uh, so let's talk today about the presence of God. Before we get into the scripture, which we're going to use today, which is in Exodus 33, 
Uh, I just want to point out that don't be in a rush to get out of here. It's only the Pro Bowl happening today. Does anybody care about the Pro Bowl? You know who cares about the Pro Bowl? My 11-year-old Micah. He is so excited about the Pro Bowl, and I'm just letting him be excited because eventually in a kid's life, they have to learn what, what disappointment is like in life. So I'm letting him be hyped up about it. He's looking forward to it. So we'll see a bunch of overpaid grown men play flag football. Um, Exodus 33, starting in verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. Verse 2, I will send an angel before you. As I'm reading this, I want you to imagine, what if God was speaking this to you about situations in your life? What if God said to you, I'm going to send an angel before you and take care of all those problems? Because that's what he's saying here. I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I will refrain from making an ites joke that most pastors do when they read this scripture. Uh, you know, about cellulites and all that. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. I said I wouldn't do it and I did it anyway. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then listen to this. Here's what God says to them. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey. This is the promised land. This is the most amazing place you're ever going to be. It's everything I promised you. It's everything you've been looking for. It's the reason you've been wandering for 40 years trying to get to this place. And then God says, I'm not going with you. I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way. Other versions read a little differently, and I, I prefer those versions. He says, I will destroy you. <laughs> I'm not, I can't go with you because I'm going to destroy you because you're a stiff-necked people. Okay, we'll get, we're going to break this down a little bit, but it's just interesting to me some of the language God uses here. I'm, I can't go with you because you guys are annoying me so bad, I might just kill you along the way. <laughs> and what's crazy is he's not talking about, the, about the, all the types. <laughs> the Hittites and the Genesis. He's not talking about the enemies of God. He's talking about his own children. It's gotten so bad with their rebellion, that God says, I can't even go there with you. Okay? It does get better. Okay? So verse 4 says, When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. And ornaments were just celebratory things. So in, in Jewish history, when you mourn, sometimes you take things off, sometimes you tear your clothes. There's lots of inter interesting things they did. But by not putting on their ornaments, they were in mourning over this word they had just got from God. Verse 5 says, For the Lord has said to Moses... Say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I wonder if Moses didn't take some joy in re relaying that information. Um, you know, it could be tough leading people 40 years through an endless desert and not receive, not, not when I close down the complaint department, okay? Um, <laughs> say to the people, you're a stiff-necked people. For a single moment I should be among you, I would consume you. Take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Verse 7. Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside of the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. Verse 9 says, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. So just to bring you up to speed, the pillar of cloud was, the, it was a, a representation of God's presence, okay? And, and according to the word, this thing would actually descend from the sky, kind of like a Chinese spy balloon. <laughs> I've been thinking for days how to get that in there. Thank your hype girl for that. She helped me figure out a way to shoehorn that into the message. So there it is. Uh, <laughs> But the cloud would descend, all right? Let's, let's bring it back, people. Come on. Uh, when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, the people would rise up and worship, each at their tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. How cool is this? As a man speaks to his friend. Everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Let me read that verse again. Verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. We're going to talk a little bit later about how things happened that brought that back for us. That we have the ability to speak to God just like a person speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent 
And I always think that's cool. Joshua wanted the presence of God so bad he wouldn't even leave. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Verse 13, now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, this is Moses talking to God, as a friend would talk to a friend. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. I want you to understand that Moses experienced the actual presence of God, and yet he sought after it. He chased after it. He wanted more. And then he says, consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And this is God. He said to him, or God said, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses said, God, I know this is everything you promised us, but if you're not going with us, I don't want any of it. That's how important the presence of God was to Moses. So our scripture today picks up in the middle of a very important and exciting moment in the lives of the Israelite people. Let me give you some context here. The Israelites, not much more than five months before this, had been freed from their slavery in Egypt. Their leader, Moses, had confronted Pharaoh with the help of God and some miraculous plagues uh, led Pharaoh to finally let the people go. During their long journey out of Egypt, their path had stopped at the foot of Mount Sinai in the desert. They had camped there for a little over 40 days, and now God was ready for them to move on. So in verse one, verses 1 through 3, we say, The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people who have, you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He promised. This is God's promise here. He said, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you and drive out all the ites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now I want you to put yourself in the shoes of God's people in this moment, of the people of Israel, hearing this command. How would you feel after being in the desert for months and seeing nothing but sand and more sand, and when you get over that next hill, you'll see some sand, right? How do you think you would feel after months of being in the desert for God to come along and say, hey, it's time to move forward? You can talk to me, how would you feel? It's just like, I don't know if anybody else hates the beach. Knew it. I knew I'd get a hand or two over there. I'm okay with it if we drive by it, right? But, you know, enduring that heat and the sand that goes everywhere. Uh, you know, when my wife finally says, hey, it's time to go back to the, to the, to the house, I'm like, yes! Right? How do you think the people, I know it's a silly analogy, but seriously, how do you think the people of Israel felt when God said it's time to move on? It's time to move forward. Do you think they got a little excited? You think maybe they danced a little people train around the place? <laughs> it's possible, right? Spoiler alert, Jesus danced that way sometimes. We'll get there. We'll get there. It's okay. I would imagine they would start packing their stuff as soon as they could, right? It's time to move on from this desolate place, from the heat, from the sand, from everything. It's time to move forward. Dancing and singing and excitement, I bet, would take place. Just because they're leaving the desert for this land that God had promised them. It's flowing with milk and honey. And it's interesting that archaeology actually kind of confirms that that was more than a metaphor. Those were prominent things back then. And those were the, those were the thing. Milk and honey. If you had milk and honey, you were a rich person. Right? That traded like gold. So I would imagine they got pretty excited. I would imagine they didn't say things like, thank thee, O Lord. <laughs> I bet they were dancing around and looking like fools. I know I would be. It's time to get rid of the sand. Right? It's time to move on. Uh, this definitely, the milk and honey sounds much better than sand, sand, and more sand. Not only were these people leaving the desert, but they were going to the land that God had promised them for generations. God had promised Abraham, he promised Isaac, Jacob, that they would be given the entire land of Canaan, where their children and grandchildren for generations to come could grow up in safety with the presence of God. Doesn't that sound awesome? Doesn't it? It does to me. It sounds awesome that God will make a promise to say, you, I can, you, we can be together forever in, in a paradise that I've set up for you. You won't need anything. The land is flowing with my favor. God was finally fulfilling his promise. The people would have been 
giddy with expectation and anticipation of being able to be the very first ones to step into the promised land. And on top of all that, God said, I'm going to send an angel before you to take care of, to take care of things. To drive out all the people that were currently inhabiting that land that God had set aside for his people. God was going to take care of it. In other words, they weren't going to have to go in there and go to war with somebody. God's angel was going ahead and taking care of it. He was going to clear the way. I think that's pretty cool. They get their own personal bodyguard as they travel, right? How many people would like to have their own personal angel who went out before you in your days to confront, I don't know, the bully at school or the co-worker or the boss at work that you've been having a hard time with or your angry wife at home? Just kidding. Well, that didn't land very well. Like this Bible. Okay, so all of the Israelite people had joy and excitement in their hearts as God shared this news with them. But all of that changed as God added one more thing. At the end of verse 3, God adds the following sentence. He says, I'm not going to go up among you, lest I consume you, lest I destroy you, lest I completely wipe you out on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. You are people that have looked elsewhere when you should have been looking to me. You are people that have complained along the way, even though I told you the, the end result would be the promised land. Can you imagine how they felt in that moment? They were ready to go into the promises that God had made them for generations. And God says, you'll go, but I'm not going with you because I'll kill you. How would you feel? All that excitement about brushing the sand out from between your toes and getting out of the hot sun and the milk and the honey, all those thoughts would probably just melt away because God said, I, I can't go with you. How would you feel? Imagine being in their shoes. Why was God so angry? Let me give you some context. As the people were camp camped in Mount Sinai, Moses went up on the mountain talking with God. This is the famous account when he got the Ten Commandments on the, on the tablets, right? As Moses received these new laws for the people, the Israelites waiting for him got tired of waiting and decided they were going to make a golden calf to worship. And as God was speaking to them, right, he was speaking to Moses, but he was putting the words on the tablets. As God was doing that, the people were already breaking two commandments. They couldn't even wait until it was done being etched in stone, right? We're not to have any gods before God, and we're not to have any idols. God had a right to be angry, and in a sense, jealous, because the people had rejected him after all he did for them in Egypt. I mean, think about all the, all the miracles that God made just to get them out of there. The plagues, the parting of the sea, the destruction of the, of the, the Egyptians that were after them. And now they couldn't even wait? For just a moment? In verses 4 through 6, we do read that the people went into a state of mourning. It says, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. No one put on his ornaments, for the Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up with you, even if I just get there for a second, God said, I'll wipe you out. I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that they may, that I may know what to do with you. And the people stripped them, stripped the ornaments. The Israelites' response to God and God's frustration and anger shows us two things. First of all, it shows us that nothing, 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 someone say nothing, nothing. can replace the presence of God. Absolutely nothing. The fact that God was sending an angel with them is cool, it's awesome, it shows that he loved them and he wanted to protect them and he wanted to take care of them. But even that fails to compare with the presence of God. Even though this was a heavenly being, a sign from God, it did not come close to comparing with God's presence. They knew, without a doubt, that the only reason they came out of Egypt and the only reason they had survived out in the desert was because God was with them and God protected them. If they did not have the hand of God on them, they would have died within days. They were clueless. They were broken. Sounds like us sometimes. They needed to rely on God. See, it is vital that in our own relationships with God, we don't settle for anything less than the presence of God in our lives. It needs to be the first. It needs to be the only thing that we pursue. You know, there's scriptures that talk about seeking first the kingdom of God. Let God take care of the rest, right? 
We are to seek after his presence above all else. It's sort of ironic that the Israelites got tired of waiting for God and Moses, so they created another God. They cre- that would be the golden calf. And when they realized this angered God and he threatened not to go with them, they went into mourning. Now let's be real for a second. I don't think any one of us has a golden cow somewhere on their property. Maybe I'm wrong. I've only been here about four years in this community. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of you do, okay? Uh, that's, that's your issue. It's a little weird, but that's okay. Someone must have one over here at this table. But here, I, want, I want you to think of it like, we, he knows, we better get rid of it. But think about it. Here's what I want you to think about. For the Israelites, that was a golden calf, right? Think about how we create our own version of that calf in our daily lives. In our culture, there are so many things that we worship and spend our time with other than God. And that is a golden calf. We look for happiness and comfort in the presence of money, in the presence of friends and family, uh, and in a sense, even church. None of those things I just mentioned are bad things. They're not bad to spend time with. They're not bad to have in your life. And they definitely can make us happy at times. But when they take the place of God's presence in our lives, they become idols. They become a golden calf. They begin to pull us away from our relationship with God. Verses 12 through 15 help us understand this more. We're able to listen in on a conversation between God and Moses. I think this is so cool. Moses said to the Lord, say, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Verse 13 says, Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight, and consider too that this nation is your people. Verse, thir- verse 14, he said, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. And he said, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses didn't want it. Moses made it cut and dry. I'm not going anywhere without you. I'm not going anywhere without you, God. Moses knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that there was not a single substitute, even if that golden calf was made of chocolate inside. I had to. It wasn't worth it. All the gold, all the things in the world just weren't worth it. And Moses didn't want to go anywhere without God. There's no substitute. He was not willing to settle for anything else. Moses truly understood just how important God's presence in our daily lives is. And the question is, well, how did Moses knew that and know that? And it's because Moses personally experienced it. Moses didn't just hear about what God's presence is like. Moses sought after God and experienced the presence of God. And I'm here to tell you, unless you have been in the presence of our God, you don't know what it's like. So if God's presence is so important, how and where can we find it? Verse 7 through 11 can give us some insight. It says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Verse 8, when Moses went to the tent, all the people would rise, and each would stand at his door and watch Moses until he had gone into that tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, which is the presence of God, right, would descend and stand at the presence of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would rise up and worship, knowing that God's presence was there. Verse 11, so the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant, his assistant Joshua would not depart from the tent. I've said it three times now, but it's still in my notes. In verse 9, the pillar of God, the pillar of cloud represents God's presence in the Old Testament during the Exodus, during the, 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 the movement of his people into the promised land. And I think one of the things we have to understand is God's presence was something that the people had to actively enter into. When they saw the cloud descend, they acted. They didn't just wait. They didn't just sit on their hands. They didn't just pray in the corner of the room and hope that something would happen. When they recognized that the presence of God was there, they did everything they could to worship him and to be with him. To go and meet with God The people had to walk out to the tent of meeting and they had to go into it. 
Later on, this tent was replaced with a temple, and then later on, it was replaced with what we call church. In order for anyone to enter into God's presence and worship, they had to go into the temple. And even then, God's direct presence was kept in the Holy of Holies in the middle of the temple, and only the high priest was allowed to enter into that. That's in the Old Testament. What does that mean to us? Let me ask you a question. Do we have to be at a church or a temple or some sacred place in order to find God's presence and worship Him? No? no? I agree with you. No. See, we have something today that those in the Old Testament did not have. And you know, believe it or not, Easter is right around the corner. We're going to celebrate Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection, the sacrifice that changed the way that we as sinful humans can approach God. Because guess what? We don't need that priest anymore, right? We don't need the animal sacrifices. When Jesus died in Matthew 27, it tells us that the curtain separating the holy of holies from the rest of the temple tore in half, and that was God saying, you can enter into my presence wherever. This symbolized that everyone was free to come to God now, but also that God's presence was no longer confined to the temple. Because of Jesus' death, everyone in this room, everyone that can hear my voice, has the ability to enter into a relationship with God and stand in His presence, having experienced His forgiveness. Jesus promises never to leave us, never to forsake us, just like He did with the Israelites in the desert because He paid the ultimate sacrifice to cleanse us from our disobedience to God and allow that relationship to happen. Second thing, verse 10 shows us that the response to God's presence is... Worship. Worship is a multifaceted thing. It can be anything from prayer, singing, shouting, a dance, as we saw today, reading the Word of God, even sitting quietly and listening, repenting, mourning, giving, serving. As we enter into God's presence, we should respond with worship, which will ultimately bring us closer and deeper into God's presence. And when we do this, if anybody's ever been into counseling for any kind of addiction, they talk about cycles, okay? And usually addiction results because of a cycle, okay? So you do one thing which leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another, which eventually leads you right back to square one, okay? So a cycle is something that is ongoing. And, one, and I, I remember I went to a counselor one time that said, to break a cycle, change one thing, and the cycle is thrown off course. And now you can start a new cycle. Cycles aren't bad. They can be good. Because my point of this is when we do this, when we, when we enter into God's presence, when we worship Him in the many ways that He gives us to worship Him, it will create a cycle. It will create an endless cycle where we grow so close to God that we'll never be able to get enough and we're constantly moving, constantly going, constantly pushing forward. God, I want more of Your presence. I want more. And I'm telling you, until you've experienced it, you'll never know. Third thing, I think Joshua found and tasted a glimpse of this cycle. It's important to realize that, you, that, the, that in the scriptures here, there's a point being made, mentioning that Joshua wouldn't leave the tent. Why is that even in there? It's one of those things I, I love about the Bible. Things that we think mean nothing. Oh, so Joshua was, well, was he tired? Did he need a nap? There's a reason we're told this. That Joshua refused to leave the tent. He stayed. And he basked in God's presence because he got just a taste of it and said, I want more. I don't want to move on without this. I don't want to do it. I don't even want to leave this tent. If it means I'm leaving the presence of God behind me. And I think it's also important to note that when you read the book of Joshua, Joshua is the one who leads the Israelites right into the promised land. Think that's a coincidence? The reason for this is because Joshua obeyed God like no other leader before him had. The whole theme of the book of Joshua is obedience to God. Joshua knew God so well and was able to lead the people into knowing God as well. And the only way that we can know God on a deeper level is to chase after him. Is to seek out his presence and sink deeper and deeper into it. So then the question would be, what does his presence even look like? Do we see the cloud, right? Do we see these things? Is God speaking to us in the same way that he chose to speak to them? As I thought about how to answer this question, 
I'm going to have to admit that I don't think I can answer that question about what God's presence looks like. Quite honestly, I kind of think it might look differently to different people depending on the situations we're in. And just like manna, we can talk about that another day. Manna was a cool thing where God fed his people and everybody thought it tasted like something different. Uh, Jewish rumor has that it tasted what it, like whatever you desired in that moment because that's how cool our God is. You know, and I think the way he he uh, his presence is manifest in us is different depending on what our needs are. Doesn't mean he's different, but the way he shows himself is different. Some people may feel peaceful. Others, like the Israelites, maybe we enter into a time of mourning and grief because the presence of God can convict. Repentance. Others get excited and happy. I love it whenever, I just love it whenever I see hands raised in worship. I'm not shaming anybody that doesn't, but man, try it sometime. I know it sounds silly, but it truly is an act of worship just to say, God, I want more of you. I want all of you. Does it mean God won't bring his presence if we put our hands down? It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that at all. God's presence, the manifestation of God's presence can be different every time. And because of this, it cannot easily be explained. It truly needs to be experienced. Nothing, absolutely nothing is more important than seeking God's presence. There's no substitute that can even come close to what God has for us. And Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection built that bridge between man and God. And everyone's welcome to walk it. When we have a relationship with God, we can enter his presence no matter where we are because he has promised to always, always be with us. We can worship him. We can draw near to him whenever we, wherever we are as we bask in his presence. God's presence and a relationship with him are better than anything else we can have this side of heaven. I promise you. Now very quickly, I want to shift gears just a bit. I want to go to Genesis 28, verses 1 through 5. We're going to tie this all together. This is about Jacob. It says, Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Pad and Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. Verse 4 says, May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. Verse 5, Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Paddan Aram, to, Le to Laban, son of Bethuel, the, Ar the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. I think what on earth this have to do with anything. All right. Here we see a two-part blessing that was passed on from Isaac to his son Jacob. Did we see that part where God passed on this blessing? It was a prayer that he would be fruitful so that he would have many descendants. And it was a prayer that Abraham's blessing of possessing the land would later be realized by Jacob. And now we go to Genesis 28 in verse 10. And this is what's going to tie it all together. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Verse 12 said he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth. Uh, some versions will say a ladder. That's where we get Jacob's ladder. It wasn't just a weird movie from the 90s. It was real. He had a dream. He saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. God was showing him in the natural something that was going on in the spiritual. Something tells me we would, if, if God would open our spiritual eyes, we'd see things like that right here. Verse 13, There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Verse 14, Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, meaning can't even count them, okay? And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Verse 15, I am with you. And I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. 
So Jacob, who was a young man at the time, is off on an adventure. He's away from home, probably anxious, fearful, uncertain, and lonely. And I believe that that night, Jacob was more than likely just looking for a place to sleep. When you're willing to put a rock under your head, you're just tired, right? Little did he know that he was about to have this unreal encounter with God. Like many of us, Jacob wasn't even conscious or aware that God was there with him, that God's presence was with him. And don't misunderstand, Jacob knew about God. He had worshiped with his father. He had spent time going to church because that's what he was supposed to do. He even went through the hassle, if you remember, of stealing the birthright and blessing from his brother Esau, Jacob and Esau. But like a lot of us, he went about his everyday routine largely unaware of the continuous presence of God in his life. So he lays down and God gives him a dream in which God confirms his promise to him that he will be fruitful and he will possess the land. But then God adds something else and he says, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. It's in verse, verse, verse 15. I haven't found one translation that says, I might go with you. I haven't found a translation that said, I did go with you. Or I, it's possible. We'll see if I have time. God is speaking in the ever present. I am with you. Always. He doesn't say I was. Or I'm going to be. He is the God of I am. He said, I am with you. I am always with you. Yahweh, which is another name for God, is not the I was God or the I will be God or the maybe if I feel like it God. He is the God of the here and now. The great I am is the God of this moment in your life. And listen, church, God is with you. He is with you right now. He is with you always. Sometimes we just don't realize that we are always walking in the presence of Almighty God. We go through our day as if he didn't exist. And if that's what we're doing, then we're missing out on so much. We're missing so much. And the hard truth is that we have to start living as though we are in the presence of the King. How would you prepare yourself for a visit to someone important? I'm not talking some high-ranking political government official, but how about maybe meeting your in-laws for the first time, or maybe, uh, you know, I hate to reduce this down to it, but maybe first date, you, you dress to impress. I'm not telling you to dress to impress. I'm talking about your heart, right? How, do we, how much do we prepare ourselves for these important meetings that we have here on earth? How much more should we prepare ourselves to be in God's presence every day? And is God really with us? Listen to the words of Jesus in John 14. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he lives with you and will be in you. We carry the spirit of God everywhere we go. He says, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. Verse 20, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. And I think the challenge here is we need to start practicing living in the presence of God. Because why would we want to be anywhere else? Notice also in verse 15 of the previous scripture that God not only says, I am with you, but he says, I'll watch over you wherever you go. What does it mean to be watched over? During Christmas season, we read from Luke chapter 2 where it says the shepherds were living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Why do shepherds have to watch, a, uh, watch over their sheep for protection, to feed them? To provide for them the basics. They ensure their survival. Shepherds actively look out for the welfare of their sheep. And they would give their lives defending their flock. And let me tell you. You are far more important to God than a flock of sheep. He's watching over you. He's caring for you. He's providing for you. Actively. He does it through his Holy Spirit. He does it through his angels. Right? 
The psalmist says, I'll instruct you and teach you the way in which you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. The Lord will keep you from harm. He'll watch over your life. He'll watch over your coming and going forevermore. We're almost done here. God also promised Jacob that he would not leave him until all of his promises were fulfilled. So I want to tell you, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, then you are blessed and highly favored of the Lord. And those are not my words. Those are his words. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8. He says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I think most of us know that verse, but let's read on. Verse 29 says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he, and those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Verse 31 says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Praise team, come on. In closing, I want to go back to verse 16. It says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought... Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Verse 17 says he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. But verse 16 always struck me as interesting. Jacob said, God's always been here, and I didn't even know it. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware. How many times have we gone about our business in life completely unaware of God's presence? Listen, God is with you wherever you go. He isn't in one place and not in another. He's not confined to the temple. Right? He lives in you. He operates through you. His presence is with you wherever you go. What a shame it would be if we wouldn't be able to recognize that. Like Jacob, who realized God has always been here, and I just never knew it. God goes ahead of us. He prepares our way. He's for us. He's not against us. The Holy Spirit of God accompanies you wherever you go. And quite honestly, if we were a little bit smarter people, and I'm, I'm putting myself in that category, we would pray more about where we go before we get there. That way we're going with God instead of us bringing him along with us. Does that make sense? You see the difference there? We'll be going with God instead of him just coming along with us. Don't ask God, what will I do today? But ask God, what do you have for me to do today? Let's close as we go to verse 18. It says, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all you that give me and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Basically, Jacob saying, God, if you will keep your promise to me, then I promise you this. I will serve you and you alone. I will establish a permanent place of worship. And I will give generously. And guess what happened? God kept his promise. Jacob kept his promise. God did what he said he would do and so did Jacob. As a result, Jacob was blessed beyond his wildest imagination. So let me ask this question in closing. Do you serve God alone? Is he the only God you serve, or have you fashioned some golden calf that fits your lifestyle? Do you have a place of worship? And I'm not even talking about coming here on Sunday. I'm talking about in your daily life. Is your heart a temple where you can worship? And do you give back to God generously? And that's not just a money thing. That is of your time, of your talent, of your life. 
We need to understand that God is for you 100%, but it is a two-way street. You have to take the initiative to enter into his presence. And as a result, you will be blessed. Amen? Will you stand and worship with us? And as we sing this song, I want you to think about what God has rescued you from. Because this song talks about how he is our rescue story, how he takes us from glory to glory. And what's so cool about that is, it's not like God just pulls us out of the mud and leaves us go. He then moves us forward, onward, upward, right? He's with us, right? He won't forsake us. Our story does not end here. So as we praise him today, I want you to think in your heart about how he's rescued you or maybe even think about how you need rescued and then reach out to him and cry out to him and he will be your rescue story. Amen. You are the voice in the desert calling me out in the dead of night fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifted me up from the ashes. You carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. You never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. This is my testimony. You were the voice in the desert. story. Not anything the world can offer us can truly rescue us except for you. God, we want your presence in our lives to be so evident that we can feel it. We can sense it. God, we pray that as we sing these words, God, that they wouldn't just be words that we sing be out of some obligation on a Sunday morning, but that they would truly be our words of worship to you, God. And as you are our rescue story, God, we put our faith and our trust in you that whatever we're facing, you never give up on us. Even when we give up on you, you never give up on us. 
God, I pray that we could experience your presence in a new and amazing way this week. I pray that when we all get together again next Sunday, we can share in testimonies of what God has done. Thank you so much, Lord, that you carry us from glory to glory, that you lift us from the dust of the earth. And God, you don't just leave us there, you bring us forward in you. God, we praise you and thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do. God, we truly believe that the best is yet to come. And we speak these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. I'm so excited you guys were here. We will see you next Sunday. But don't forget, if you're able, come Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Uh, lights are flicking. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go home. You can't stay here uh, kind of thing. So uh, we'll see you Wednesday at 6 or next Sunday. If anyone's able to help real quick uh, with, with our cleanup, that would be awesome. There is. The banquet is rented here shortly. So God bless you all. We love you.